Good evening friends we are at hotel Leela Mumbai for the book launch of uh, Mr K N Raghavan who is the central Mumbai GST commissioner his book titled dividing lines will be launched today all by the hands of Mr SM Krishna former governor of Maharashtra This is uh, an extremely well-researched uh, book that uh, Mr. K. N. Raghavan has been able to pen. Uh, I think uh, India-China relationship is uh, a relationship which is always very sensitive, and uh, it is also a very uh meaning and uh, mr raghavan has spent quite some time uh in uh, uh, writing this book and i am sure that it is going to be one of the most useful contributions for understanding the implications of india china relationship ट्रेमेंट and uh, uh stability is something which uh, all of us will have to keep playing uh, because there is no minimum program of action as a result of that uh, nobody knows the direction in which the government is heading but when anyway, we will wait and see we will wish wish them all the best uh, sir, uh, during the uh, killing of journalist sugya uh, buhari in kashmir two uh, of the per three persons are arrested one is a pakistan man and and two are the indians so you, uh, you think that this is a cross border terror part of the cross border terrorism that happening in kashmir the killing of the journalist is also well i you know kashmir uh, is passing through a very difficult uh, a period and uh, uh, let uh, 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 let us not uh, add uh, uh, bring in more complications to the already uh, complicated relationship that is uh, existing there i would rather uh, sir the not bjp is observing the black day yesterday during the emergency as a senior most uh, politician in india what is your stand regarding that well emergency was uh, uh, accepted as uh, uh, a great failure even by mrs indira gandhi you know so all of us uh, who feel Uh, that uh, the uh, the observance of the anniversary of an emergency uh, about which on hint sight all of us are united you know all of us are united in uh, opposing the emergency you know now it would be it should be uh, a guidance for uh, the future uh, that at no time in the in the foreseeable future uh, the kind of emergency that came into being will not be repeated again a very warm welcome to you all today we are here for the official launch of the book dividing lines contours of india china discord by dr k n raman 
starting the function, I would like to introduce to you all Shiswarup Nanda, President, CEO of Eat Star Publications. A mechanical engineer with an MBA in marketing, Shiswarup's passion for literature and books is his motivation for building Eat Star Publishing, which is now a leading publishing house for India. The Eat Star list features distinguished authors and writing from across the globe. Today, Lead Star Publishing has 10 brands and publishes over 200 titles a year. Now, I request Shri Swarup Nanda to speak a few words about the book and the author. Hi, a very warm good evening to all of you. Thanks for assembling me uh, all in this kind of units and uh, supporting the book. Uh, I'm not an expert on the India-China relationship. I had more questions than answers. I hope uh, the panelists today will help uh, answer some of my questions. A couple of questions that I had, uh, especially for all you uh, India-China uh, relationship uh, experts. Uh, first part of the question was, uh, uh, the way Pakistan is going, would we have two Chinas on both sides of India, China and Pakistan becoming a satellite state of China? And uh, how uh, extreme is the situation at Northeast? Do you actually see uh, a real conflict developing where we could lose the entire of Northeast? During the okay. Moving on, I would request the Honorable Chief Guest, Sri S. M. Krishna, to speak a few words on this occasion. So, ladies and gentlemen, I feel it a great honor that I have been asked by Mr. Raghavan to release the revised book that has been written by Mr. Raghav. Let me start by congratulating Mr. Raghav for his work which is being formally released today. I believe this, is, this has been updated. The earlier publication was done six years back. And uh, I'm sure the updating has been quite useful. It is said that we can choose our friends, but not our neighbors. I think this is an old adage. And it is more so in international politics. India and China have been the holders of great civilizational legacies that mankind has known. But we have also had good neighborly relationship over a period of time. But the relationship became a bit uncertain and at times very hostile. As a result of which today we stand at the threshold of the relationship becoming very hostile. The bilateral ties, though they culminate, uh, they culminate in certain border conflicts, but we continue to engage each other uh, with a 
a sense of trying to mend our fences with each other. But the reason behind the sudden deterioration of the relationship to the extent that uh, armed hostilities should have taken place have been subject to intense speculation and debate ever since. It is essential that a true account of the factors that contributed to the discord which grew into a conflict is placed before the public so that we not only learn from them but are also better placed to avoid the pitfalls when confronted with similar situations in the future. This book performs the remarkable function of presenting before the public the factual position regarding the events that took place in the years following independence till the outbreak of hostilities. Foreign policy of India, India was by and large shaped by Jawaharlal Nehru because all through the year that he continued as Prime Minister of this country, he continued to be in charge of foreign affairs. That's largely because Pandit Nehru had a deep insight into the, not only the history of India, but also the glimpses of world history also. As a result of which, even while he was fighting for the liberation of our country, he simultaneously continued to be a very keen student of international politics and global relations. I think truly the foreign policy of India was laid by the Indian National Congress because it had a foreign policy cell which was mostly headed by both Nehru and Dr. Raman over Lokia. Both of them were experts and authorities in their own right. During the 1920s and the 30s, Panit Nehru was a very keen student of international politics. Nehruji had taken keen interest in international affairs from an early age and was an astute observer of the events that took place in Europe and other parts of the world even during the early part of the 19th century. He had warned India and the world about the events of fascism and damage that governments rooted in such political thoughts could cause to maintain. He had developed a warm personal relations with not only other leaders, but with the leading thinkers and philosophers as well. Thus, Nehru's foreign policy was not a mere statement formulated of promoting interests of our country. 
it was also an expression of its ethical and ideological moorings. China was the cornerstone of Nehruji's foreign policy when it came to bilateral relations. Despite the concerns over actions taken by Beijing with reference to Tibet in 1950, India strove hard to build good relationship with our neighbor across the Himalayas. In the process, relinquishing the rights bequeathed by British administration as part of the Panch Shield Agreement signed in 1954. This situation arose as a consequence to one of the major blunders of diplomacy on our part since our leaders at that time were clever enough to, to, to take Chinese appeasement and false assurances, credible enough to believe in a peaceful resolution of Tibet and its concerned issues. By unilaterally giving up our rights, we could neither reserve for ourselves an issue nor could we significantly bargain, we, we could significantly keep it as a bargaining tool in the later border disputes that came up later on. On this specific issue, Nehru was also apprised or warned about the dangers from China and clearly so by Sadar Vallabhai Patel through his letter on 7th November 1950. He said very explicitly in his letters that Chinese still saw India with suspicion and our amiable ways are waste of time with this neighbor. To quote, he said, Chinese do not regard us, their friends, with the communist mentality of whoever is not with us is against us. Is a significant pointer of which we have to take due note. Despite this, for the lack of faith in the voices inside the government or for romanticizing communist China as a trustworthy partner and hailing Hindi Chini as brothers, Nehru could fathom the importance of this forewarning, couldn't fathom the importance of this forewarning. And we continue to tread the path which led to the 1962 fiasco. The legacy over the non-demarcated border in Akshay Chin and coordinates of McMohan Line and the unrest in Tibet, which saw Dalai Lama freeing from death and taking refuge in India. It shall play, play up Chinese fears and apprehensions. The gradual escalation of tensions through 1959, the collapse of talks in 1960, and the implementing of the ill-fated forward policy from autumn in 1961 are events that 
led to the armed conflict in October, November 1962. Mr. Raghavan had chronicled the events that took place during these years in an effective manner, laying bare facts, bare the facts, leaving it to the readers to arrive at their own conclusion as to where the fault lines lay in preventing the outbreak of hostilities. It is a well documented fact that Indian Army suffered reverses during 1962. Many books have come out on this subject, most of them penned by senior officers who either took part in that war or played a leading role in strategizing and planning that war. It is not an easy task to explain planning and execution of combat plans in language understood by the, the common man. Here, I would like to compliment Mr. Raghavan for not only describing the battles fought in a style and manner that is easy to read and comprehend, but also for analyzing the reasons for the adversities in an even-handed and dispassionate manner. At one point during the war, when Chinese forces had reached up to the gates of Assam, Nehru was forced to seek military assistance from the United States of America and the United Kingdom. Though both countries obliged, pressure was mounted on Nehru to open, negotiation, open up negotiations with Pakistan for finding a solution to the Kashmir problem. This was a very difficult period in the history of India and the, and the nation and should always remain grateful to Pandit Nehru for tackling the situation with aplomb and interesting and ensuring that there was no change in status quo in Kashmir. Though India also took the path of economic liberalization in 1991, our pace of growth has been much slower. The opening up of the economic and consequent growth have opened up many avenues for bilateral cooperation, particularly in the arena of trade and commerce and movement of people. Incidentally, India's trade with China is one of the largest one that we have with any other country. Though more than half a century has passed since the hostilities took place, it remains a fact that the impact caused by the war and the reverses suffered therein are still fresh in the minds of Indian populace. The borders continue to remain non-demarcated and non-delineated. Despite numerous rounds of discussions between the two sides and the discussions seem to be continuing even till this day. Both sides naturally continue to make claims over the territory held by the other. Dalai Lama and the Tibetans who came to India with him have made this country as their own home. 
standoffs between the armed forces of the two countries still keep happening, Dokla being the most recent example. All these make the responsibilities of the officials of the External Affairs Ministry of India a challenging one. And it has to be said, and I can say it with authority, that we have one of the sharpest and one of the most uh, dynamic external affairs uh, ministry officials in government of India. On the one hand, there is a pressing need to engage with China on a continuous basis, while on the other hand, they are required to protect the vital strategic interest of the country. This book written by Mr. Raghavan performs the commendable task of placing before the people all these aspects which have been, which have been bearing on India's bilateral relations with China. There is an acute need for enlightened public opinion on this vital subject and this effort by the authors perhaps is a right step in the direction of achieving that objective. I sometimes wonder how Mr. Raghavan developed an interest on this particular subject. After all, you, your uh, preoccupation with uh, your uh, commitments and your responsibilities and simultaneously this uh, studying uh, the India-China relationship is a very complicated issue and uh, it has to be on a day-to-day -day basis and uh, Mr. Raghavan perhaps uh, has taken it as some kind of a challenge and uh, he has turned his thoughts and we all become beneficiaries of sharing his insight into India-China friendship or India-China relationship. But on the whole, I think the book has come out indeed very well and uh, especially those who are students of uh, India-China relationship, this book will be one more uh, added on uh, to that category of books that have come out, come out and uh, which is very useful to all of us. I would like to congratulate and commend the efforts of Mr. Rawan for coming out with this book and uh, I hope this gets the kind of attention that's needed by the Ministry of Veteran Affairs. I wish him all luck. Thank you so much. Moving on, I hand over the session to Dr. Jabin Chetra, who will be moderating the panel discussion. Over to you, sir. Uh, Krishna, Your Excellency, we will now have a formal book discussion in which we hope to push uh, you on some of these themes that you uh, highlighted. In fact, uh, my job as the moderator is going to be to uh, highlight and flag some of those themes that uh, the, uh, the former foreign minister actually raised uh, during his presentation. Um, before I get into the discussions, let me first of all 
also congratulate uh, Dr. Raghavan for this uh, book. You know, those of us in Chinese studies have a hard enough time uh, doing just our work. And here we have uh, a former physician, uh, a government serv civil servant, also writing a book on China. It puts us regular academics to shame. So my uh, congratulations to you, sir. And this is a very finely written, readable book. It's not the kind of books that academics write, which I'm sure many of you find very difficult to read. So if you want uh, a good, racy read, then this is, uh, this is for you. Uh, the second thing I wanted to highlight is, it's important that we are having this book discussion in the city of Mumbai. Uh, I'm not sure just, uh, you know, some, how many of you are aware, it's something quite often forgotten, that uh, the subject of this book actually has a connection to Bombay. Uh, the boundary dispute is partly to do with China's extreme sensitivity to questions of territory, sovereignty and so on. And uh, this sensitivity relates or arises from the fact that the Chinese, uh, what the Chinese call the century of humiliation. The century of humiliation started, the so-called century of humiliation started sometime in the 1840s with the first opium war. Uh, by British, uh, between the British and the Chinese, and Bombay has a connection. Uh, the city of Bombay actually developed and grew in the mid 19th century on the back of the trade by the big business families uh, of Bombay with China. It was started off with cotton, then it moved to opium, but uh, later the textile industry, the ship building industry, all of these grew on the backs of the trade with China. So this is the history that uh, you know, Mumbai girls especially shouldn't forget. Um, now with me on the dais, uh, of course, uh, been introduced to the uh, Mr. Krishna and Dr. Raghavan, but let me also introduce uh, Commodore Uday Baska, uh, who is a former Navy man, but also one of the most senior and most well-respected think tankers in the country. Uh, Kamada Baska is the head of the direct, uh, is the director of the Society for Policy Studies in Delhi. He was formerly uh, a deputy director and officiating director of the Institute of Defence Studies and Analysis, which is a think tank of our Ministry of Defence. Uh, and uh, to his left uh, is Professor Shetan Kundapaldi, who is uh, one of India's most well-known, well-respected China hands. Um, he is a professor at the Center for East Asian Studies at Jawaharlal University. Uh, and he is also a recipient of the K. Subramaniam Award. Uh, K. Subramaniam, as you know, uh, was one of the doyens of Indian strategic thought, a former IS officer, a former, and also a former director of the Institute of Defense Studies and Analysis. Uh, and I, uh, a little update from what Manu gave you, uh, I am the associate editor of the China Report, which is an academic journal, it's the only academic journal to devote to full time to East Asian studies in India, in South Asia in fact. And it's, well, it's well over 50 years old, one of the oldest journals devoted to China in the world in fact. And I also did my PhD from the same center that uh, Professor Kondopoli did. So we have three doctors on stage, but only one of whom can actually save lives. Uh, so, uh, well, Professor Kondopoli and I hope that we are saving lives in the long term by our work. Uh, so let me uh, quickly introduce the format. Uh, I will have a round of questions to all of the four uh, panelists, uh, two minutes each, and then we shall progressively reduce the number of, uh, the, number of uh, the amount of time that we have for each uh, speaker. Um, so let me, and then I think we will have a few minutes. And this doubt for the first uh, publisher, we may be write a chapter, why I wrote the book, which is a, I'll just put it in a very simple, uh, short terms. Uh, I, I was born in the 1960s, so I grew up as part of a generation which held Nehru as probably one of the greatest personalities in the world. So, but when you trace the biography of Pandit Nehru, you find that the China episode sticks out as an aberration. Why did he allow a situation to develop where the country had to go to war and the situation where he suffered military reverses? When I read about the topic, 
I found that the explanation offered was China established in the back. It was a treachery or deceit of the part of the country. He relied too much on Krishna Menon, and because of that, we had this reverse thing. It appeared too simplistic. It was only when I had a posting in Singapore and I had time and access to the publications that I found that most of the information that was available in public domain, except the research papers and all, which ordinary persons don't have access to, did not portray the correct picture. Actually, the role played by both the protagonists in the drama. So, as I read, I found that there's more and more information was coming in. A person like me who has a very keen interest in history did not have access or did not know the facts. There's a high chance that the others also would not be having or would be considerably less informed than what I was. So, the idea was to write something in very simple language. The facts, as I saw it, try to make as objective an account as possible in a language that people like me can understand. So this is just a very humble offering in that direction. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Krishna, 1962 is also a very special year for you. That was the year you entered the Legislative Assembly in Karnataka. So uh, maybe you could give us what your feelings or thoughts were when this event of 62, the conflict with China, broke upon the national consciousness. I mean, that's a perspective that many of us don't have. Yes, uh, it is some kind of a coincidence that uh, my entry into politics, uh, my entry into public life uh, was uh, almost uh, synchronized with the Indochina conflict. And uh, the whole nation was getting worked up uh, because of uh, the Chinese aggression. And, uh, well, I was just, I was then in the opposition and uh, I joined hands with uh, the then government of Karnataka and uh, we had uh, a defense council which was set up and it would be extremely interesting for uh, you ladies and gentlemen know that we had two field marshals as part of that defense setup, both General Karyapa and General Timaya were members of that subcommittee, the committee of uh, defense. And we were so inspired, we were so thrilling to see General Karyapa uh, well, uh, earlier I had met General Karyapa in a different context as the Law College Union President, but uh, meeting him uh, uh, as part of a deliberative body like the Defense uh, Organization, it was an extremely interesting. Colonel Vasco, uh, as a military man, my question is, it's a very vast topic. What is the impact of 1962 on the Indian military? I mean, if you can summarize in two minutes, uh, I'll take all the ages. Summarize in two minutes is a tough order. But at the outset, can I just take a minute also to add to what Dr. Javin Jacob has said and what Sarah Krishna has said to first of all congratulate the author, Dr. Garman, you know, for a very lucid book. And those of you who have not read it, I would join the governor in saying that this is an extremely readable book and I think the younger generation would benefit. In lighter again, I wanted to say that, you know, in the last 35 years that I've been looking at the subject and looking at scholarship, I'm aware of a general Raghavan, some of you may know him, he's general B.R. Raghavan, who used to be in Delhi and also a think tanker at this time, a very illustrious general of India. We also had Ambassador Raghavan, T.C. Raghavan, who till recently was a high commissioner in Pakistan. And this city has Dr. Srinath Raghavan, who has written an exceedingly you know, comprehensive book on India US. And I am now very glad to meet Commissioner Raghavan, you know, who is this series of authors who have written exceedingly, I would say, important contributions to this particular subject. So that having been said, Dr. Raghavan, congrats. I hope you will do one more book and I want to thank your team all sitting here for the excellent arrangements and making this evening possible. And specific to the questions that Dr. Jacob has asked, what was the impact on the Indian military? 
Now there is a whole section in this book that Raghavan, Dr. Raghavan has written about the way in which the Indian military, quote unquote, was surprised, was humiliated. And there is a lot of detail about the principal players, starting with General Thapar, the army chief at that time and the others. When I look back, you know, I was also a very young man, young boy in school at that time. But I do know that when we joined the NDA, soon after the 1962 war, there was a certain trauma, collectively, institutionally, about the humiliation that the Indian Army in particular had suffered. And I would say it took almost a decade that the 1971 war for Bangladesh, in a way, I think, assuages the kind of quote-unquote humiliation that the Indian Army went through. In 1962. And after that, maybe if there is one kind of unstated objective that the Indian military internalized, is that we would never let another 62 happen. I think that is how I would summarize the thing. Professor Pandupali, to you, uh, well, in India we proud, you know, press speak and you know complain a lot about 1962. What is the view on the other side? How do the Chinese look at 1962? How important or unimportant is it to them? Well, let me also join the panelists to congratulate Dr. Raghavan. Uh, I think the uh, book is very comprehensive, um, especially for those who are not informed about the 62. Uh, one of the beauties of this book is uh, to put across all the views that have come up on the uh, 62 war and even before uh, the territorial dispute, both in the eastern western sectors and also in the middle sector. Uh, the views, opposing views as well as the uh, views that the establishment had quoted, uh, to that extent it was a, uh, uh, an objective assessment. Uh, he did call a spade a spade by suggesting that the offer of Chawan Lai in 1960 could have been accepted in terms of the swap. Uh, the McMahon line in lieu of the outside chain. Uh, which is roughly where we probably, after 15 years, we will probably settle down to uh, in future in the special representative meetings. Um, uh, so to that extent, I think there is uh, a lot of information in it, uh, very passionate argument about this. Let me congratulate Dr. Raghav. Uh, on the query, uh, uh, one of the weaknesses in Indian scholarship is on the Chinese perceptions. Um, uh, in fact, uh, many Chinese uh, sinologists in India have also failed to fathom the Chinese mind, except to state probably what Chowdhury and I had stated, which were there in the uh, much of the uh, uh, talks between Chowdhury and Nehru, which was published uh, in terms of the uh, correspondence between the two leaders, or Mao Zedong's uh, articles or Mao Zedong's. Uh, speeches, especially the one which was published in People's Daily, where uh, the, the title was The Political Philosophy of Mr. Nehru, where he called Nehru as a running dog, dog of imperialism and uh, ultra-nationalist and so on and so forth. Um, so these were the uh, major uh, staple diets for many Indian scholars who have not gone deeper into uh, the Chinese uh, scholarship. Um, uh, of course, the Chinese are also very, very reluctant, uh, partly because uh, as a victor, they don't have to reflect on the 62 war. But as one who was defeated in the 1930s Japanese war, uh, as the one who was defeated um, almost uh, during the Korean War, where there was a stalemate, the Chinese obsession on Korean War on Japanese is larger than compared with anything on it. Uh, because in India, on the Indian front, there have been victors. So, as a victor, there was not much literature. Um, <clears throat> having said that, the Academy of Military Science in China published a semi-classified book, uh, and I inquired with the government officials in India. I heard that there is only one copy uh, with us, uh, and not translated uh, still, uh, because that's in classical Chinese, uh, and so on. We have very less expertise on that subject. Uh, nevertheless, uh, the Academy of Military Science, by the way, you can also uh, Google it, uh, get this book in PDF form, 
electronic form uh, any time. Uh, it basically reflects who, uh, the title is very tantalizing. It's a self-defensive counter-attack by China or India. It's a self-defensive, it's not, uh, you know, as uh, some commented, uh, as aggression by China, but it is a self-defensive and it's a counter-attack. That China never attacked, uh, although Mr. Raghavan does mention about the uh, the uh, Chipcha Valley, the, uh, the Namkachu uh, incidents, uh, where the Chinese have actually uh, acted upon the Indian patrols and so on. Uh, nevertheless, the Chinese official argument is it's a self-defensive counter-attack, not an attack by themselves, but it's a counter-attack. Uh, so that remained in much of the scholarship in China. Uh, that it is a self-defensive one, uh, so they painted in public discourse that it is self-defensive, uh, much to a large extent that continue. Uh, later on, Xu Yan published another book from the PLA, he is a PLA, People's Liberation Army historian. He published this book uh, in Hong Kong, because China would not probably allow such kind of a publication. So uh, we translated those uh, two books uh, and uh, it appears from, it was, uh, just, yeah, it appears from these yeah. that uh, there is a, a lot of sensitivity on the Tibet issue, uh, as Dr. Raghavan had mentioned in the book as well. Um, and the points that Ra Dr. Raghavan mentioned in terms of Nehru giving orders that uh, in Western sector not to provoke, not to uh, go forward, similar statements were made by Mao Zedong as well in those declassified documents that they are not willing to uh, 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 chase the Indian patrols and so on. So similar language that was used by Nehru uh, simultaneously around the same time uh, the Chinese were also using. Uh, yeah, I will, I, will, I will actually come to that in a bit. Uh, let me uh, follow that up with a question to Mr. Raghavan and uh, uh, Your Excellency, which is uh, the question of uh, course correction. Even as uh, we misinterpreted, uh, as Mr. Krishna, you mentioned in your, in your, present, in your speech, uh, you, you also quoted from uh, Sardar Patel's letter. So, my question really is, it's not as if the government was unaware of its shortcomings. It's not as if uh, Sardar Patel, if you go back a little further, the 1951 Museum Himal Singh Ji Committee on our infrastructure actually pointed out where the weaknesses were in our preparations. But from 1951, we simply did not act. So my question really is, what is it that prevents you know, systems within the government from acting? How is it that we are unable to foresee, anticipate? Mr. Rahul, Dr. Rahul. If you look at it from 1951 to 1954, it followed a very, very planned strategy because if you, if you look slightly backwards, you will find that India, when it became independent, there was something interesting that Nehru was quite valley with Chiang Kai Shek's. In fact, uh, even during the independence movement, there was a report of Ma'am Chiang writing about India's flight during President Roosevelt and all. But after that, Nehru tried a different China and the Indian intervention during the Korean crisis was a step in that direction, followed by the Pachil Agreement, where we relinquished all the rights that we have inherited on Tibet. But if you look at it, following that, we took one step forward. We replaced all of our maps, which were in existence, which were brought out in 1950 with the maps that we have now. We firmed up, we fixed the borders. Probably the line of thinking was that once we fix the borders and they are considered to be non-negotiable, we, we had that done. So, and one of the major points raised in the letter of Sardar Patel of 7 down by 1950 was about Chinese presence there and how we will protect the borders. Even Sinji committee had laid down certain things, but we did not have the resource at that point. The armed resources to, uh, or rather the resource to raise, raise an army, which would be able to take on the mighty Chinese war machine. So probably this was a step that was taken, but probably it, this step backfired because we, in our urge of uh, to include the territory, made the mistake of including Aksai Chin also. But as we had stopped with the McMahon line, probably did not have become the problem, it became something else. 
you know, uh, this reminds me of a uh, discussion, and Professor Wonderful was part of it, uh, we had in China about 10 years ago. Uh, we were at the Indian Embassy, and this question about history came up with the Chinese, uh, how, you know, whether we actually had claims to those areas. And the answer was, you know, if the Indian claim isn't strong, neither is the Chinese claim. So, essentially, I think what both countries have forgotten is that, you know, before there were no hard lines between these two countries. Flow of people, flow of trade, flow of religion, goods, moves smoothly. Nobody needed a visa, nobody needed a passport. But we have now adopted the Western way. And in fact, while the European Union, well, until recently, the walls were coming down, we have built walls much stronger uh, than the Westerners themselves. Uh, Mr. Krishna, a question, because you are a minister, is that, uh, you know, the Henderson Brooks Bhagat report on the 1962 conflict by the army, this report has still not been released in the public domain, even though I think most academics have a great sense of a good sense of what contains, what is contained in the report. What explains, and this despite different administrations, doesn't matter the political colour, but no government has released it so far. What's your explanation for this? Well, there are uh, certain uh, uh, issues which need to be kept under wraps for a number of reasons. Well, it is all right for those who have been investigating into the happenings of those years you know, and trying to make an assessment, either making a point in favour or against. But I think government as a continuing body will have to remain committed to certain secrecy and certain classified the documentation and that's how they continue to be under wraps. So if I may quickly come to the other end, which is from the land borders to the sea. Uh, again, uh, to you Mr. Krishna is that, uh, you know, I was doing some research and in 2012, July of 2012, as foreign minister, you had made a statement uh, at the ASEAN Regional Forum in Cambodia, saying uh, that uh, freedom of navigation and access to resources uh, must be guaranteed. And a few months ago, before that, you had said that the South China Sea uh, is a global it comes, it belongs to the globe rather than just to any one country. From 2012 to 2018, there has been a sea change if you will excuse the pun, in the capacity in what the Chinese have done, right? So what has India done, and you, uh, you used to teach international law, I believe. So what has the Indian government done, uh, you know, except talk about it? How have we, as opposed to the Americans, managed in any way to stop or stall the Chinese? Yeah, a number of uh, things have happened in uh, the South China Sea. Uh, in uh, around uh, 2012, that's when, you know, it, it became rather uh, very reflective of the times. I remember in one particular meeting that was taking place in uh, uh, Tokyo, Australia, Japan, Indonesia, India, we were all together in trying to prevent China claiming uh, the uh, overlordship of the South China Seas. We said that no such overlordship can be claimed because it is meant, seas are meant for trade and other activities. 
So, a very country that I have particularly mentioned, we are very particular that we would like to pursue our own national interest through free trade and free navigation. And uh, China certainly tried to sell the theory of uh, the Chinese suzerainty over the South China Sea. In fact, uh, the Foreign Minister of uh, China did uh, seek my personal support for uh, uh, that uh, particular right of China, which we as a group of nations opposed it and uh, to a very great extent we succeeded in consolidating that position of these nations. Today it is, uh, it can be said uh, that uh, there is free trade which is being pursued by all these nations. Yes, but the issue really is about uh, China's assertiveness, its reclamation. And in fact, Comrade Bhaskar, to you, my question really is what do we make of China's assertiveness? I mean, you're talking about South China Sea, but you know, Gwadar in Pakistan is 1300 kilometers as a crow flies from Mumbai. Uh, how are we going to be able to deal with this? China is going full fledged ahead in terms of its assertiveness in terms of reclamation, its building partnerships in South Asia with Maldives, Sri Lanka, Bangladesh, all around us. What's the way forward for us? Uh, what's the way forward for us? Can I just back up a bit and Javin, you can interrupt me in case it becomes longer than intended because this is a pretty complex subject. First of all, I want to extend the point made by the minister also, which is that as far as South China Sea is concerned, China has exhibited a certain assertiveness. It's a very muscular assertiveness in terms of one, the interpretation of international law as derived from what is called as the UNCLOS, the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea, and customary practice. And I thought I'd say this for the benefit perhaps for maybe the younger generation here. What China has done in the South China Sea, very often we use the word artificial islands. Actually, that's a misnomer. If you know the sort of background to the South China Sea, many of the regional countries have made a claim to the islands which are in that particular area. China has introduced what they call as the historical claim that there is a nine dash line and that entire area belongs to China historically. And they have used technology to create what are called as artificial installations. Because the moment we concede the word island, and here we have an international law expert, they are then able to claim certain rights based on what islands are able to obtain under the UNCLOS. So that's a very important distinction, which is a legal point, that what they have created are not islands, they are artificial installations. Therefore, they cannot claim the kind of exclusive economic zone rights that otherwise are available to genuine islands. So that's point number one, that you see this very creeping and now muscular assertiveness of China, wherein they have also rejected the international tribunal about which Philippines are taken and that's a whole lot of politics about U-turn in Philippines. That's one aspect. So this is just a thumbnail. Specific to the Indian Ocean, which Dr. Jacob has asked, saying, what can India do? I think there are two points here, and we are sitting in Mumbai, which is headquarters of the Western Naval Command, and you have the whole Western uh, seaboard of India. One is an empirical reality, that China has made a very clear kind of strategy to increase its footprint in the Indian Ocean region. <coughs> Now this is a very, shall we say, long drawn out plan and if you read Chinese history and politics, they have been talking about this, I would say, since the time of Mao Zedong, 
right down to Deng Xiaoping and through the Zhang Zemin period to Wu Jintao and the Malacca dilemma and so on. And there's a very clear strategy that they have adopted to increase their political, economic and military footprint in the region. The most recent example is what has happened in Sri Lanka. I don't know how many of you are following the politics of Sri Lanka. But they had given them certain loans when President Rajapakshi was in charge in Sri Lanka and got them into the equivalent of a very high debt situation. And today the reality again, the reduction is that the port of Hambantota has been leased to China for 99 years. Now that is an idea about what they can do in Sri Lanka. Similarly, they have now got a footprint in Djibouti, which is on the Horn of Africa. So this is the empirical reality. China in Maldives, China in Sri Lanka, China in Bangladesh. They are giving submarines to Bangladesh, China in Pakistan, Wadar and so on. So the Indian response is that we have to really, I think, step up. Meaning that the Indian experience in Maldives, the Indian experience in Seychelles, the Indian experience, if I may say so, even in terms of what is happening in Bangladesh, would suggest that we need to do a lot better. Otherwise, we will have a situation where the Chinese footprint in the Indian Ocean across the board, political, economic, trade and military, will be of an order that would constrain India's peace. And I think we need to be cognizant of that, but I don't think we are doing as much as we ought to. Okay, uh, to return to the border, uh, if one of the things that uh, uh, Dr. Raghav mentions in his book uh, is the problem of logistics. He talks of a general who had uh, you know, had problems acclimatizing, not one general, but several generals who had problems acclimatizing when they were in Arunachal. Uh, my question to you, Professor Kondapalli, is in terms of infrastructure, how does India compare today to what the Chinese have built up on their side of the line of actual control? Again, this is a very vast topic, but if you could just focus uh, on, the, I mean, on the eastern sector, which is Arunachal, which is where most of the attention seems to be as far as the Chinese are concerned. What's our status of infrastructure? Uh, indeed, uh, I think uh, that's a very important issue in terms of logistics uh, build-up. Uh, Dr. Raghavan mentions this uh, by suggesting at Namkachu, for example, the supplies were only 30% uh, uh, retrievable from the air uh, because there are no roads. Uh, uh, secondly, there is uh, uh, it took about five days for General Kaul to reach the border post, as he mentions in the book. Um, again, there are so many other bottlenecks. Uh, acclimatization is one, uh, the uniforms, the uh, winter clothing, and so on and so forth that were referred to in the book. The current day reality is that um, uh, much as the Chinese have done in terms of the 54 to 57 Aksai Jin road, uh, today they have 84,000 kilometers of roads just in Tibet. Uh, in the last five years, they added 24,000 kilometers of roads in Tibet. Uh, as compared to uh, the, uh, uh, let me give one example. The Chinese have outposts all across the border. Uh, we have outposts uh, uh, partly as a result of the forward policy, the 64 outposts in the western sector about 42 of them in the eastern uh, uh, and then trying to revamp these. Now today the Chinese come on jeeps, uh, motorable roads and then jeeps uh, straight away onto the border, onto the line of actual control. Uh, Indian side, especially in the middle sector, it takes about three weeks for the ITBP, Indian Indo-Tibetan Border Police personnel, to reach the uh, the, uh, the line of actual control areas in Barahoti, in uh, Tigri, Tangrila, Rimkibla, in other passes. So that's the kind of logistics build up the Chinese have made. So as a result, the government of India made a committee in which Sham Shadan was one of the members uh, who went to the border areas. And then the idea of strategic roads came up uh, and the railways and so on. So 64 uh, roads have been identified, much of these in Arunachal Pradesh and in Ladakh sector, both western and eastern sectors. Uh, and there is some work that the border roads organization is currently now, uh, I was told that about 60% of these roads are completed. Uh, uh, but there is a lot more work to be done in terms of connectivity to the uh, nearest outposts. 
The second one is in terms of their railways. Uh, you may have seen that Prime Minister Modi recently went to Arunachal Pradesh to inaugurate one of the railway stations. So this is one, uh, uh, and there are uh, there is a plan. The Parliament there was an issue raised uh, uh, of nearly one lakh twenty six thousand crores to be spent for the uh, the railway connectivity to the Arunachal Pradesh remote areas and so on. Uh, this is also partly uh, as an aspect of Act East policy, where we connect to the uh, Myanmar, Thailand, and others. Um, uh, this is to be doubted. The third area is in terms of air connectivity. You may have seen that three new air bases have been established recently uh, Hashimara, Chabua, and Tejpur. Uh, we have been deploying Su 30 aircraft. Uh, Mr. A.K. Anthony, the former Defense Minister in 2009, mentioned that. Strategic assets will be shifted towards the northeast. Strategic assets would mean a lot of other, you know, strategic weapons uh, and so on through these Su-30s and so on and so forth. Uh, in addition, you may have seen in the newspapers about the ALGs, uh, advanced landing grounds, being revamped. Re recently, you may have seen a photograph in the newspapers about uh, the ALGs being revamped uh, in Parshuram Kund in Arunachal Pradesh, in the easternmost portion and the other areas. Uh, likewise, in Daulat Bay Goldi as well and in Chushur, uh, there are these ALGs uh, reconstructed, revamped and C-130Js have landed in many of these places. So, right, the air connectivity issues. In fact, it's interesting, uh, you mentioned air connectivity in the Northeast. If you uh, look at it, air connectivity in the Northeast at the time of independence was much greater than it is today. Many of these old uh, uh, routes have stopped or many of these old uh, air, uh, landing grounds fell into disuse until very recently. So uh, actually China has concentrated the mind and uh, efforts to build up or rebuild infrastructure at least in the north. Uh, let me come now to the question of personalities. Uh, Dr. Raghavan, in your book Nehru, of course, is a central character. Uh, Sardar Patel has been mentioned. But, you know, what has the role of personalities been in this conflict? 62, everybody talks about is an India-China issue. But, you know, as Professor Mandapati also mentioned, Mao Zedong is a central character. Nehru is a central character. It, it seems like while these relations are between two large countries, essentially they are driven by personalities or individuals. So, uh, your views on that? Personalities have certainly played a huge role. Uh, there is no denying the fact. Like, uh, Indian policy was framed and uh, implemented by Pandit Nehru. Chinese war plans were controlled directly by Mao Zedong. So, there is an armed voice that is shifting the PF to the east and then launching a massive attack. Withdrawal. All these are flagged to perfection. I just like to mention one particular aspect here because the person who lost out the most as a result of the conflict was none other than Defense Minister Krishnamaya. Obviously, he was not a very popular person with the military. There was one section which was vocally opposed to him. Uh, General Timaya was very unhappy with him. He was known to be good, not just in military but with people also. So, generally, he was very unpopular and uh, his proximity to Pandit Nehru annoyed many people. And he he resigned uh, in the aftermath of the first round of the debacle and uh, 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 he did not become minister again. I just like to record something which I read recently. In fact, it was after the book went to press. This is a biography of Krishnamanan by P.J.S. George, which was published in 1964. Uh, in that book, there is a mention about uh, the 1960 talks between Nehru and Chau, which took place in Delhi. And Indian foreign policy established was extremely adamant that while Shavanlai met the President, the Home Minister and the Finance Minister, there would not be an audience with Krishnamayana. Krishnamayana managed to meet them, but that's besides the point. The point was that Krishnamayana had put forward a very interesting suggestion that in lieu of India giving Aksai Chin on lease to China, probably China could give on lease the small area between Sikkim and Bhutan. This is something he had suggested in 1960. This was spent in 1964. If you Forget all these things, probably if that suggestion was given some serious thought, we would not have had this document right now. So, what 
I am suggesting is that while we tend to place too much emphasis on personalities and tend to reveal some, because if you if you want a scapegoat, you have one or two for that. But these are people who have thought a lot about the subject and contributed a lot. And this is something which uh, this book probably would have run out of it. I just happened to chance by a Malayalam copy which I got and I read through it. And it immediately struck me that he had probably thought about the damage potential caused by the Chinese person between Sikkim and Tibet. And in those days, Sikkim was an independent country. So the role of personality has always been there. But I would say in this conflict, it was not just the personalities involved, but it was between what India did to provoke the Chinese viewers and apprehension support Tibet. Mr. Krishna, a related point. You mentioned uh, Nehru's central role uh, because he was a foreign minister as well. You also mentioned towards the end of your speech the dynamism of the MEA. But the fact of the matter is, the MEA is actually one of the smallest ministries, one of the smallest foreign ministries anywhere in the world. We have about 930 odd officers. Uh, uh, I know that the Chinese foreign ministry is going to have about 15,000 people by 2020. So that's the kind of level that we are punching at. As a former foreign minister, uh, you know, moving beyond personalities, how, what were the shortcomings you saw in terms of institutionalization or strengthening of the MEA? I mean, what are the faults that still exist? What are the problems that still exist? I mean, if you have a deal with China. Uh, I think uh, uh, in comparison, I think China is a much more resourceful country than what we are. And uh, as you yourself mentioned, that uh, you ask any foreign service uh, person, he will say that uh, we are understaffed and we don't have enough men, uh, we don't have enough research uh, assistant, uh, assistants to support, support us. But that is because uh, the kind of uh, 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 the budgetary limitations that uh, we in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs have. And uh, whereas for China, there is no such uh, limit, you know. Well, for China, you know, they don't have to go before parliament for uh, sanction of demands, you know. I think whatever uh, uh, number one man says, that becomes law, you know. I think they have some decided uh, uh, initial advantages. And one of those advantages is that they are not accountable to anybody. And when you are not accountable to anybody, then, uh, then uh, things can happen the way it happens in China. Well, <laughs> you know, lack of accountability means you can spend your money. Uh, I mean, you get the money, but you can also spend the money wrong. Uh, and that also, of course, happens in China. Uh, but let's let's move on. Uh, and you know. The final question, and ladies and gentlemen, we'll get to a question and answer right after this. Final question is to you, Dr. Bhaskar, and this is a question that needs to be asked. Uh, again, moving on from personalities and to, to institutions. Uh, one of the big themes in this book is the question of how poor civil military relations were in '62. Uh, you know, as a former head of a think tank. Uh, uh, or heading a think tank still, but also having worked within government. What is the state of civil military relations today in India? Uh, and this I ask also because it's becoming much more fused in China itself. Not that that is a model to follow, but still. Uh, and also, how easy or difficult is it for the, you know, maybe to clarify, how easy or difficult is it for the military to get its point of view across to the political masters, to the parliamentary committees? Uh, thanks, Javan. I think that's a very important issue. First of all, I'd also like to draw attention to the book by Dr. Raghavan, where I think he highlights one of the big inadequacies of 1962 when we look back upon it. Let me add, if the media is here, 
that very sort of humbly and very firmly I'd like to objective advise including that rendered by Jadu Thimaya Sir, if you remember, when he was the army chief. So this is one aspect of 62. Fast forward to where we are now, 2018, which is what Dr. Jekar was saying. Again, I submit very humbly but very firmly that today, under Prime Minister Modi, the civil military relationship is inadequate. It is done episodically. Let me close on this judgment if I may and I hope the media is able to take this on board. India does not discuss national security in the parliament because the Indian politician or parliamentarian does not find it, shall we say, a subject that is worthy of any serious. Watching politicians, government officials, military officials uh, from this side. So uh, now I think we have about 10 minutes uh, for Q and A. If any of you would like to ask questions, anybody in the panel? The relationship of uh, China, India, vis-a-vis the -vis Bangladesh, Pakistan, then uh, Maldives, then Sri Lanka. What about Nepal? Nepal has been traditionally and uh, for a very long time they have been a friend of India. And there has been increasing influence of the China in Nepal. And in, in fact, we should remember that Nepal has an open border. If China comes there, they stand in your gate. So that's a thing, uh, what is a panelist? Any, any uh, panelists think about the how to control the influence of the China in Nepal and what the government of India is doing that? I just put it this way. We are mature enough to avoid a war. If war comes when there is a total failure of diplomatic relations. We experienced that in 1962. And one of the biggest lessons of 1960 is that we will not repeat the mistakes we made in 1962. Both India and China have too much at stake to risk another war. So, why did Doklam happen? Doklam happened because a series of incidents happened before that. This is my theory that we had the Belt Road Initiative. The only two countries in the region we did not take part in that were the two countries who were actually at the receiving end of Chinese activities in Doklam, Bhutan and India. So, it, China is a very aggressively nationalist country and they pursue their strategic interests very aggressively. This is a point, this is a message which I feel they had sent out through Doklam. War would not have been on their agenda. They just wanted to show that, don't take us lightly. Right from DRI to coin postings, how did you find time to write a book on such sensitive topic that requires a lot of research? I joined the service in 90, just 28 years. All through I had excellent colleagues with me, excellent senior officers, uh, colleagues and uh, the staff working with me. So what happens is that they all do their work wonderfully well and I am left with very little job to do. So I, I invariably end up spending my time reading, writing books, umpiring and so on and so forth. That is the only reason. All of you are, most, uh, most of my senior officers and colleagues are here. So I would just place on record my deep gratitude to all of you. It is only because of you that I get the time, I get the peace of mind and uh, to continue with my pursuits. There is no other reason for that. So just thanks a lot for that. My question is, uh, we have, or India already have a neighborhood policy, uh, which is very important. But in recent times, if we see uh, our all the neighbors, means almost all neighbors are not unhappy with us. They are recently Seychelles is also unhappy with us. Maldives, there is turmoil in the relations are down. Nepal also relations are down. Uh, don't you, don't we think that it is a high time uh, we should uh, critically uh, rethink our neighborhood policy because. Uh, China's domination in our neighborhood is increasing and it is proving the means, uh, US string, string of pearl theory that it is a uh, right theory. It depends on people like you and me. Uh, not because you are in the IRS or because I am an academic, but because we are citizens of a democratic republic. The, you know, the way forward is explained very clearly in the preamble of our constitution. So all we need to do is put our heads down and focus on that. I thank the panel for such an exciting and insightful session. It is certainly a rare opportunity to have such luminaries at one platform and especially on a hot topic, hot theme like India-China relations. Moving on, I would request Dr. K. N. Raghavan to present and honor our chief guest by giving him a show.
We have with us Mr. K. N. Raghavan, GST Commissioner, Mumbai Central, on the eve of his book launch, Dividing Lines. So, the title of the book is Dividing Lines. Uh, what was the thought about giving this title to the book? This book traces the history of the conflict between India and China. The two nations, the two or the oldest civilizations, greatest civilizations that the world has seen, never fought a war till suddenly in 1960. There arose a dispute which ended up in a war. So, what exactly were the factors that caused the divide, which was big enough to end in a war? So, the book traces the history of the conflict and the sequence of the armed conflict that took place subsequently. That is what the dividing line stands for. What made you uh, write about this book? How did this idea came about? I am a keen uh, interest in history. So, when the history of our country is taken during the last 70 years since we became independent, we find that the greatest national humiliation was the war of 1962. So, a statesman of the caliber of Nehru was the Prime Minister. But still, despite his leadership, despite his vision, we were forced in a war which, where we suffered reverses. So, there is something which had intrigued me. There were no simplistic explanations like China behaving in a treacherous manner or Krishna Menon letting us down. So, I just dug deep and read about the subject and then I found that most of what I had read in public domain were not very accurate. So, I thought I should just jot down no points for my own sake. It grew into the shape of a book which the publishers were nice enough to publish. My idea is to present the facts in a simple language, the sort of which people like me would understand. Uh, a bit of uh, history made me think about, you also stood in a one day as an umpire in 1998. Uh, tell us about that part of your life. Now, cricket again was a passion. Uh, like most Indians, uh, it was a first love and it remains a subject very close to the heart. Not good enough to be a great player, but I was lucky enough to start umpiring at an early age. I qualified into Ranji panel in 1991, did matches, got promoted to All India panel and then got the opportunity for umpiring one day internationals. So, I was in the panel which was doing the international matches from 98 to 2003. I was a reserve umpire on three occasions, third umpire on two occasions and did field once. Uh, did you see Sachin batting on the field? What was the feeling like? <laughs> well, uh, more than that, I will remember the first match where I was a third umpire. was a match where Sachin became man of the match for his bowling. He picked five wickets at Cochin versus Australia. So, well, it's amazing to see all these players at close quarters. Uh, amongst your favourite cricketers in the current Indian team, can you name one and why? It's difficult to name a favourite, but then like most Indians, I am a fan of Dhoni. Uh, I am equally a fan of Virat Kohli, the sort of batting and the sort of leadership that he imparts. It's a very, very different thing. Because if you look at it, you have three different personalities who have guided the course of Indian cricket since we opened up the economy. Tendulkar, then in the 2000s it was Dhoni and now we have the more aggressive Kohli at the head. It's very interesting to read and watch these people in action. Do you still follow cricket? Are you, are you still passionate about cricket? Yeah, I am. I am very passionate. Uh, so, coming back to the subject, uh, we have GST which is completing one year uh, in July. Uh, tell us your views about the system overall and you know, how the first year has gone by. First year, there have been, there were teething troubles which the government was quick to understand and uh, make concessions to the trade. The initial period is bound to be difficult. The difficulties had to be tackled by the government and the taxpayers together and there has been a constant effort at that. Looking back, it's a year of great satisfaction, but there is a lot of work to be done which you're on the job. Any other passion apart from cricket? Uh, what are your likes and what, what, what are your hobbies and all? Reading and writing so I, and cricket, that takes up the whole time and following any sporting event like I am watching the World Cup very closely these days. Who are you rooting for? <laughs> Again, a difficult question. Well, I, I, I'm not very sure because right now all teams are in a very, very delicate stage. But I've always been a fan of Brazil for the type of soccer that they play. Good evening, sir. Welcome to Media. This is uh, Mr. Vivek Nair, Chairman, Hotel Leela Venture. What do you feel about this book, Dividing Lines, which a GST Commissioner has written? Uh, it's uh, very educative and it's very much needed. Because when the GST scheme was launched, there was a lot of uh, 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 lack of clarity on various issues. 
And now, I think it's over a year now since it's launched and things have become uh, very much clearer. So the book could help to increase that awareness amongst the business community. Good evening, sir. Good evening. Welcome to Media. Thank you. Thank you very much. Sir, thoughts about new beginning of India-China relations? We need to have stronger relationship with China. We need a closer relationship with China. We need to put behind this what happened 55 years back in a war. That's a short for a short period. So we have strong trade relationship. We need to take it forward in a more transparent and stronger basis. Good evening, friends. We have with us uh, Mr. Anil George from the Chairman's Office. Uh, your thoughts about this event? Good evening. Um, I'm very proud that this book launch, Dividing Lines, by Dr. Raghavan, the GST Commissioner of Mumbai, is happening at the Leela, the prestigious Leela Hotel. I wish all the best because this gives us a deep insight on India-China relationship. All the best to you. Moving on, moving towards the end of the function, I would like to express my sincere gratitude to the Chief Guest of the function, His Excellency Sri S. M. Krishna, for taking out time, sharing his perspective on the book. I also thank the illustrious panelists, Commodore Sri Uday Bhaskar, Dr. Srikant Kondapalli, Dr. Jabin Jacob, for agreeing to enlighten us and give their valuable opinion on the book and insights on India-China relations. I thank Dr. K. N. Raghavan for writing this book, which, was, which has been so well received, and for motivating the departmental officers to pursue and nurture their passion amidst the routine. I thank Ms. Sangeeta Sharma, the Chief Commissioner of Central Tax Mumbai Zone, for taking out the time for the event and gracing this occasion. I thank Shri Swaru and the entire team of Lead Star Publishing. I also thank the members of the press. And I thank everyone out here who has made this event a success. Thank you all. And uh, now I would request you all to proceed to the high tea. Have a good evening.